Associate Director for the Mailman Center for Child Development. Welcome to Grand Rounds for Mailman Center in the Department of Pediatrics. It is my extraordinary privilege to be able to introduce our speakers today, um, Isaac and Nora Pilotensky. They are both trained as psychologists but have done so much more than that. Um, each of them in their own way has really moved forward the field of how we think about well-being, both for children and, and for adults. Um, their various titles, assistant professor, dean, they have done the usual academic things, publishing papers, writing books. You may also have seen in the Miami Herald that Isaac has an article there every once in a while that makes us laugh. Um, we've been involved in a variety of projects together. I just want to make one sort of way of how this fits into the world of pediatrics and medicine and psychology nowadays, and that is that medicine is being transformed in the United States. For centuries, really, physicians and others were paid for doing things. So every time you did something, you got paid more. And now we're transforming it to be about, well, no, actually, we want to pay physicians and other clinicians because of outcomes. How do people do? And are they really healthy and well? And we're right at the infancy of trying to figure this out. And so most of these quality measures are about very precise, small medical things, like did you get your vaccinations on time, which are incredibly important, but don't really get into things like well-being and how healthy people are and what's their quality of life. So it's perfect timing to have Isaac and Nora come and talk to us about their research on what is well-being, what does it really mean, and that can help us get into a discussion about how we actually measure. So please join me in welcoming the Pro Okay, thank you. Thank you very much for the opportunity to be here and to see so many friends and talk with you. So there are three parts to our presentation. We're going to introduce a multi-dimensional model of well-being, we call it ICOPE. We're going to talk, or I will present, on our model of change. We develop an integrative model of change. And finally, we will share with you the results of a randomized control trial, implementing the theory as well as the method of change. So this is an online program. It's called funforwellness.com. And we will give you all the details in a few moments. So uh, let's get started with uh, well-being, and we call it multiple domains and multiple connections. So the field of subjective well-being refers to the level of satisfaction with life as a whole, but also with individual dimensions uh, within life. And we know that subjective well-being it's highly related to physical health, mental health, substance abuse, and healthcare cost and utilization. So it's really important to understand how we can promote well-being because there are clear implications for physicians, psychologists, nurses, and uh, policymakers. So the theory that we are developing is called the ICOPE because it includes interpersonal, community, occupational, physical, psychological, and economic well-being. And in a study we conducted to validate this theory, we found, you can see here, that all these individual domains are highly correlated to overall well-being. These are highly um, significant cor uh, correlations. And also, our individual domains are highly correlated to comparison measures. So we have a basis to say that these are individual factors, but they are all highly related to overall well-being as well. So the interesting thing about this is that each domain contributes to the enhancement of other domains. So for example, interpersonal well-being is highly related to physical health, cardiac health. People who benefit from social and emotional support are less likely to have heart attacks, more likely to resist the common cold virus, a less degree of stress, etc. And this came to uh, be symbolized in the lives of Johnny and June Cash. Do you remember them? So we were professors at Vanderbilt University, so we knew a lot about folk music uh, and country music. And June Cash died in early in 2003. And about four months later, Johnny Cash died. And this was really emblematic of a problem that many 
older men experience, which is when they lose their wives, they become isolated, depressed, and they get sick. Of course, it's not a one-to-one -one correlation, but this was really a reminder of the toxic consequences of isolation. In one of our own studies, we evaluated the presence of well-being in different demographic groups, and we confirmed many previous studies in which married people experience higher levels of well-being than divorced or single individuals in most domains of well-being. Now, when it comes to community well-being, it's important to experience connections with other people for a number of reasons. Uh, contributing to the community contributes, n helps not just to build social capital and the social good, but also your individual health and wellness. We know that there is an emotional boost in helping. We call this the helper therapy principle. And we know that groups can create collective norms to promote health and wellness above and beyond individual effort, because you can tell somebody quit smoking, uh, it is incredibly difficult, but if you create norms that it's not allowed to smoke, the collective can have a great impact. So we know, for example, that social interventions like Alcoholics Anonymous and Weight Watchers, they help because they enhance accountability for the process of change. There is positive peer pressure. If you're trying to lose weight by yourself, you have a 24% chance of maintaining the gains after 10 months. But if you do this with a group of strangers, the chances double. And if you do it with a group of friends or family or relatives who will support you in this endeavor, your chances go even higher. So I grew up in Argentina. I ate more meat than you could ever imagine for the first part of my life. And then Ora and I became vegetarian and eventually we became vegan together because it was very difficult for me to do this by myself. <laughs> so there are many things you can do with groups that you cannot do by yourself. So I'm going to show you a little clip of how working with other people can be so much fun and engaging in physical activity. so much fun. So what about occupational well-being? One of the most robust findings in the social sciences has been that if you are unemployed, you are going to experience a lot of depression. But if you have a good working experience, if you are engaged at work, your overall physical and mental health will go up. So this is related to the construct of engagement. Are you psychologically present at work? So we know that men who live to 95 uh, didn't retire until their 80s, uh, because in this case, work is a proxy for engagement. You don't have to work until you're 80, but you definitely have to be engaged in some meaningful, productive uh, activities. Um, we also know that at work, your relationship with your manager can be either health enhancing or very detrimental. People always report when we survey people about their 
highest level of stress during the day, they say when I talk to my boss. So all of us who are bosses here, we should take notice. Okay. Uh, so as I said before, unemployment leads to disease and depression, and this engagement can cause a lot of problems. Uh, so this is one of my heroes. This is Sir Michael Marmot, who is a British epidemiologist. And Marmot was here at the University of Miami last year addressing the medical students. Uh, and Marmot uh, had an incredible discovery showing that when you compare people across occupational echelons, uh, people in lower occupational uh, realms, they have much higher degrees of premature mortality. And this was based on a 30-year study with 29,000 people with the British Civil Service. And what Marmo discovered was that what differentiates people is not that the clerical staff smokes more or eat fatty foods more than the boss. They control for all these variables. What they discovered was that the level of control people experience at work is predictive of overall health and well-being. So the boss has a lot of responsibility. The boss is stressed, yes, but the boss also has a very high degree of control over his or her environment. This is called the red line that you see there. It's called the social gradients, and it has been replicated in many countries around the world. In, in wealthy countries like Sweden, in poor countries, all over the world, you find the social gradient, because individuals who do not experience as much control over their daily life are more likely to have higher levels of stress. Now, we found in our own study that full-time, part-time, and retired people experience higher levels of well-being than the unemployed, and people in management and professional occupations also experience higher well-being than those in service and manual labor. We replicated what has been found in other studies. Now, what about physical well-being? I don't have to tell you. You are better experts than we are in physical well-being, that we know a great deal about the control uh, the, we can control the expression of genes. We know that we should eat the well, uh, but in actual fact, very few people follow these um, guidelines. What we found in our own study is that older people experience higher levels of well-being than younger people in all domains except physical well-being, which makes sense because the body doesn't work as well as we age. But when it comes to psychological, interpersonal, community well-being, older people have higher degrees of satisfaction. So for all of those, those of you who worry about the empty nest syndrome, I want to tell you it's a wonderful thing. <laughs> you know, like your kids leave home and you go, yay! So, um, anyways, you know all the benefits of physical well-being, uh, but the economics of ill health are very telling. 50% of all healthcare spending is consumed by just 5% of the population. Isn't that astonishing? That relates to Dr. Brosko's notion of prevention, that it's not just about giving more services, it's about changing lifestyle. 75% of medical costs are due to preventable conditions. So we really should be doing much more in prevention. So what do we know from studies about psychological well-being? We know that happier people are healthier, more productive, more resilient, they live longer. And one of the key ingredients in psychological well-being is what we call self-efficacy. People set high goals. People with a high degree of self-confidence in achieving their goals, they work better interpersonally, at work, and individually. So there are really some key domains in psychological well-being. We call it a sense of mattering that you can feel value, that you can add value, that you have a sense of control over your life, that you experience efficacy and meaning. So this is a picture of our son uh, some years ago. Uh, our son, Matan, is a chess player. Um, and he was playing the master here in Harvard Square. And chess for our son is a great source of mattering self-efficacy because he really uh, enjoys this activity. It's engaging for him. So uh, he challenged the master. The master usually in Harvard Square, he charges you $2 to kick your butt, basically. <laughs> uh, but that was until he met our son. Um, so our son uh, beat the master, and the master was very unhappy. <laughs> uh, but this is just an idea that 
people have to find sources of meaning in many different ways. For our son, it's chess. For you, it may be the violin. And for some others, maybe saving lives. But it's really important to find something that really gives you great meaning. So for us, mattering and a sense of psychological well-being is really about two things, feeling valued and adding value. And there are different sources of feeling valued, ourselves, people in our family, people at work, and in the community at large. And here at the University of Miami, we're trying to create a culture where everybody feels valued, but also has an opportunity to add value so that people do not feel helpless. People can have an opportunity to be creative and innovative, and we, your bosses, will listen to what you have to say. So uh, there are threats to mattering, and I'm going to show you a, a short clip where Professor Franz de Waal, a primatologist from Emory University, demonstrates the toxic consequences of not mattering in capuchin monkeys. So pay attention, it's a minute and a half. So a final experiment that I want to mention to you is our fairness study. Uh, and so this, this, this became a very famous study, and there's now many more, because after we did this about 10 years ago, uh, it became uh, very well known. And we did that originally with capuchin monkeys, and uh, I'm going to show you the first experiment that we did. It has now been done with dogs, and with birds, and with chimpanzees, um, with, but with Sarah Brosnan, we started out with capuchin monkeys. So what we did is we put two capuchin monkeys side by side. Again, these animals, they live in a group. They know each other. We take them out of the group, put them in a test chamber. And there's a very simple task that they need to do. And if you give both of them cucumber for the task, the two monkeys side by side, they're perfectly willing to do this 25 times in a row. So cucumber, even though it's really only water in my opinion, but cucumber <laughs> is perfectly fine for them. Now, if you give the partner grapes... The, the food preferences of my capuchin monkeys correspond exactly with the prices in the supermarket. And so if you give them grapes, it's a far better food, uh, then you create inequity between them. So that's the experiment we did. Recently, we videotaped it with new monkeys who had never done the task, uh, thinking that maybe they would have a stronger reaction, and that turned out to be right. The one on the left is the monkey who gets cucumber. The one on the right is the one who gets grapes. The one who gets cucumber, note that the first piece of cucumber is perfectly fine. The first piece she eats. Uh, then she sees the other one getting grape, and you will see what happens. So she gives a rock to us. That's the task. And we give her a piece of cucumber, and she eats it. The other one needs to give a rock to us. And that's what she does. And she gets a grape. And she eats it. The other one sees that. She gives a rock to us now. Gets again cucumber. She tests the rock now against the wall. She needs to give it to us. And she gets cucumber again. OK, we don't want that, right? We don't want to treat people unfairly because frustration leads to aggression, right? And we have known this for a long, long time. So psychological well-being is highly correlated to the experience of fairness. And if you experience inequality in the workplace or in the community, there is going to be a buildup of frustration and aggression that it's going to unleash very many negative physical and, and, and health consequences. So, if, you know, the, the sense of helplessness and low self-efficacy, which is what was induced in the monkey, is one of the most negative psychological experiences that you can have. So we want to avoid that at all costs. Uh, and we want to avoid all these things that are going to create a sense of helplessness and depression in our families, in our children, in schools, in the community. So I'll just say a word or two about economic well-being. We know that economic well-being is tied to the GDP of a country. Richer countries report higher levels of well-being up to a point. At above a certain degree of income, it really, you have diminishing returns. So you may work 
24 hours a day to make more money, but eventually uh, you are not going to be happier. Money helps with basic needs, but above a certain threshold of about $75,000, it doesn't make much of a difference. What the research does say about disposable income, though, is that if you have extra money, you better invest it in experiences as opposed to objects. So the research shows that the best thing you can do with disposable income is go to a park, take your family for, an ex for a nice vacation, go to nature. Don't go and buy another pair of shoes because it, the money is not going to give you a high return on investment in terms of psychological well-being. So what we found was that more income leads to higher overall and psychological well-being, but for this to occur, there has to be a big gap in income. So when we compare people who make 50,000 with those who make 65,000, it's, it's barely noticeable the difference in psychological well-being. You have to compare somebody who makes 25 with 75 to see a big difference, right? So uh, money is really important for basic necessities. No question about it, but there are other domains of life that contribute more to your overall well-being. So now I'm gonna turn it to Ora, who's going to talk to you about a theory of change that we developed and implemented in, in our study. So, over the world. So can I have the clicker? Y uh, no, yes. <laughs> there you go. Okay, so we know that people often want to improve well-being, but they may lack strategies um, or, or ways of doing that. So we created an intervention that we call Fund for Wellness and uh, it's based around seven drivers of change that forms the acronym Bet I Can. Um, so this stands for behaviors, emotions, thoughts, interaction, context, awareness, and next steps. And we're trying to teach two main skills under each driver of change. And I'm going to quickly just say a few words about those uh, concepts. So first of all, under behaviors, we, the goal is to help people learn how to set a good goal and to create positive habits about them, uh, in their lives. Emotions is how to cope with negative emotions that are obviously a part of our human experience and how to cultivate positive emotions. Thoughts is about challenging assumptions, unhealth, unhelpful assumptions about our lives that many people have and how to write a more productive, health-enhancing story. Uh, interactions is about connect and communicate of communication. Context is about the ability to read the cues in our environment, to see what's helping us and what is getting in our way and how to change those cues so we can do more of what we want. And awareness is about really knowing the issue that you are dealing with and knowing yourself, your own patterns. And next steps is um, to reinforce the idea of making a plan, a workable plan, and uh, how to make that plan stick. Okay, oops, sorry. <laughs> So we're starting with behavior because oftentimes we need to look at our own behavior and change it when we want to improve well-being, but this is what Mark Twain famously said, we know that changing behavior is difficult and we need to acknowledge that, that it's difficult to do that. And one of the main reasons that it's so difficult that it's often a struggle between the now and the later. What we want right now, this immediate gratification, right? We are hardwired to seek immediate pleasure and gratification versus what we want in the long term that, re that requires us to delay gratification. It's that conflict that makes it so difficult for people. Um, but the, the place to start is with setting a goal and there are, not all goals are created equal and a good goal is one that is first of all about changing yourself. As a psychologist, I've seen many, plenty of people who want to change others. If only my <laughs> wife would change or husband or whatever. So the only person we can really change is ourselves, so um, the goal has to be to change yourself, which should be consistent with what, you, what we really want for ourselves, obviously realistic within our control. Better to state a goal in the positive, rather than stop screaming at my kids in the morning, how having a pleasant morning with my children. That's a positively stated goal, and something that can be broken down into sub goals. We, can, we still need to, to begin with a very specific single step, 
something small that we can uh, that we can accomplish, something that is specific, measurable, attainable, relevant, and done within a, a certain uh, time frame. So it could even be we'll, we we will get up earlier every morning. We'll get up ten minutes earlier in the morning um, during uh, school days. That's a very specific sub goal. We know that uh, there's plenty of research that shows that people have a specific plan on how they're going to implement their goals do better than those who do not. So having a really specific plan, where will you be, what will you do and how will you do it, when and where, because that helps us to think about what obstacles may get in the way. And when you think about the obstacles, you can have a plan for overcoming them. We're always better when we plan those things in advance. Okay, so I'm moving on to emotions. As we know, are just kind of, these are a natural part of our human experience. They're unavoidable and, and they're not they're not a problem. They can actually be quite instructive, right? They sometimes tells us about what we need to change. But we also know that negative emotions can kind of intensify and sometimes spiral out of control like a tornado. People feed their negative emotions. We know that it is a common trigger from problem behaviors and, and it results in lower self-control. Um, we also know that we can cultivate positive emotions and positive emotions definitely broaden our perspective and our possibilities. We are more creative, more energetic, kinder, more empathic uh, when, uh, when we experience a lot of positive emotions. So it really builds resources over time and also facilitates self-control. We are much better able to manage our, our behaviors uh, when, uh, when we experience positive emotions. So just a few words about coping with negative emotions. We know that there are many maladaptive ways that people uh, uh, engage in to try and soothe negative emotions, right? They think about addictions or junk food or whatever the case may be. Uh, we also know that some people avoid situations because they're afraid of that they'll feel anxious or that they won't do well or that the others won't like them. So that leads to avoidance behavior. But if we, um, if we think about our private experiences as something that we just have, we don't have to escape. We're much better if we're able to actually tune into our emotions, really try to understand them um, and differentiate what exactly, what am I feeling, what led up to it, what were the triggers, what thoughts were going through my mind, what was in the environment, who was I with. We're in a better position to do something about it. Um, so accepting our emotions, practicing kind of self-compassion. Uh, what we need to avoid is not the emotion itself, but maladaptive ways of regulating emotions. So it's our own behavior that we need to, uh, that we need to um, regulate. So th there are many ways of coping with, with uh, negative emotions, such as repraising the situation to change its emotional meaning, how we think about it, problem solve, seek support, and so on. Okay, now, the, the, the field of positive psychology has, uh, given us a multitude of proven strategies for cultivating positive emotions. I'm just going to mention a few, but many, many exercises and exercises that would uh, help people adopt and cultivate an attitude of gratitude, right? Some simple things like keeping a gratitude journal, you've all heard of those things, uh, making a list of things that people, that, that people feel grateful for, blessings in their lives, writing a gratitude letter, uh, being mindful and actually inhabiting the moment. I think of that a lot when you see, I see families sometimes in restaurants and they're all, everybody's sitting with their, with their phones and really they're all somewhere else, right? Thinking about the past, planning the future, but not really being in the moment. moment. So savoring it, positive experiencing, balancing pleasure with purpose, as Isaac said, we, we have a need to matter. So these are some of the ways that, um, that people can cultivate positive emotions. Moving on to thoughts, because you know, thoughts, emotions, and behaviors are all interconnected. So uh, how we think and what we say to ourselves affects how we feel and what we do. And we are more, most likely to, to talk to ourselves in stressful situations, and what we say will have a powerful impact on how we respond. The thing is that oftentimes, self-talk is automatic, and it's something that we don't even notice that we're doing. Many people, uh, say many things to themselves in stressful, stressful situations that really has a very negative impact on their emotions and their behaviors. Um, and so you see this, this loop. 
So the best we can do is teach people to identify their self-talk. Again, it's, it's often automatic, so we have to really pay attention to it. And, and we know also that that kind of negative self-talk is often erroneous, right? People don't, don't really question what they say to themselves. They believe that this is the truth, but often it's not. So is this a reasonable thought? Is there evidence for it? Is there evidence that can dispute it? Does it help me to think this way? What would I say to a good friend if, if she were in that situation where people say to themselves, I'm not good enough, I'm never going to make it, all those kinds of things. So either you, people uh, can learn to modify their thoughts or to just change the relationship to their thoughts. Thoughts are just thoughts. Just let it go. You don't have to feed it. You don't have to harp on it, but we, we need to accept it. Okay. Interactions, Isaac already spoke about this, but we know how important healthy, close relationships are. They certainly contribute the most to our happiness, but we also know that, that toxic relationships lead to great distress. So uh, close, intimate relationships are great, but a lot of discord in a, in a marriage is quite toxic. Okay, so, um, but of course people have to invest in good relationships, right, to really make time. We know that, that um, in close relationships where there is kind of what, uh, what, what Gottman called a positivity override, people have many, many moments of positive, of positive emotional interactions. And they, it serves like emotional money in the bank. So that when the ine inevitable conflict arises, they're in a better position to handle it because there's already so, so many good moments and so much positivity in the relationship. Uh, we do this by focusing on people's strengths, by, by recognizing, celebrating, have, helping partners meet their goals, and so on. And, and of course, always striving to remain supportive and constructive in the face of conflict. We're not going to succeed always, but uh, we know that social support is a, is a critical component of self-change plan, uh, and there are many ways that people, that, that partners can help and close others can help by encouraging, phrasing, modeling, joining the behavior, the, the, uh, what people are doing, listening, supporting, problem solving, and also reminding and giving feedback. You know how you were trying to stay away from eating this? So you need to, so many ways of doing this. Okay, context is about um, our, about reading the cues in our environment and changing them. So every behavior take place, takes place within a context. <coughs> there are always antecedents that act, act as triggers before the behavior. And when these triggers are present, we know that, this, that a certain behavior is likely to occur. And then there are consequences that come after the behavior and affect whether or not you repeat the behavior. The more aware we are of what is the context of our behavior, the better able we, uh, we are to change it. And a trigger can be anything. Something in, the, in our environment, it can be interpersonal, another person, it can be mood, it can be the things that we say to ourselves. So it's really being aware of, um, of what are the triggers. So, the, so people who are kind of good detectives and are aware of how their environment is affecting them is in a better uh, position to try and change this. Uh, so what we need obviously is to avoid triggers that cue problem behavior, uh, we need to introduce cue, uh, triggers that cue desired behavior. And Alcoholic Anonymous teaches people to pay attention to people, places, and things in their environment. So this is what happens, right? When we have like, a, when we, our brain has like a surge of dopamine, when we see these kinds of things, and we can't help ourselves and we want it. So just to be aware of that. And we can have uh, healthy cues to trigger healthy behavior. Uh, I'll just show you this very quickly to show the fun way of what context can do.
we're, we're coming to the end of the, of the wheel. So awareness is about knowing the issue and sticking our head, head in the sand and facing the facts about whatever, whatever situation we are dealing with. Also about knowing ourselves, right? The, the more people know their own patterns, their triggers for behaviors, their value that should guide their goals and behavior, all that can contribute to future growth. And finally, next step is about uh, reinforcing the goal. We believe in greasing the plan, we, remembering that goals, we should make something gradual, like small steps, the importance of rewarding, reinforcing good behavior, making it easy, um, coming up with alternatives, right? So fruit instead of whatever, of sweets, Doing, doing something supported with other people and educating, educated, informing yourself. So that's how we grease the plan. And how to make our plan stick. We know that uh, oftentimes we need to continue to control the environment because it's very easy to revert back to unhelpful behaviors. We need to plan for high risk situations and most importantly, remember that setbacks are normal. Many people feel that once they, once they fall off, it's like, that's it, I can't go back now. And they, they feel like such a failure. But we know that setbacks are not the exception, but the rule. We know that from, there's a lot of research that, that has, uh, that has uh, shown that. So what, what people need to do is just to get back on the horse if they uh, sleep. Okay, and I'm just, just uh, another, another few words. Because health, um, health professionals so often work with people and try to help them change their behavior, we have to remember that uh, behavior change unfolds in stages. People are all over the map in terms of where they are in the change continuum. And I, my experience has been working in a rehabilitation hospital for a few years that in the past that oftentimes health professionals may um, give patients uh, ideas that actually don't match the stage that they're in. So if somebody is in pre-contemplation where they don't even think they have a problem, uh, then it doesn't help to tell them this is what you can do to fix it, right? So we need to match the strategies for change to where people are at. So people that are in pre-contemplation, they don't really think there is a problem, they think nothing they can do about it, or they're just contemplating, uh, they, need, uh, they need knowledge, they need awareness, they need emotional engagement. It's only when people are ready to take action, when they're already in action, and they, that, that, that's when they need to know how to control triggers to change the behaviors and uh, reinforce desired behaviors. So we have to match the strategies to where people are at. And that's it. So Isaac, Great. So you... then what we did, um, we put everything that we told you so far into an online intervention to promote health and well-being in the different domains of life, interpersonal, physical, psychological, using all the drivers of change that Aura just described. And we call it the Fun for Wellness intervention. It's freely available. It's called funforwellness.com. So we did a randomized control trial of this intervention, which was built to support physical and mental health because as I said before at the beginning, well-being is predictive of physical and mental health. And now we have technologies to reach millions and millions of people. And the literature supports a variety of techniques. It's not just about cognitive behavioral therapy. It's not just about positive psychology. It's not just about psychoanalytic techniques. It's about what each of them can contribute to positive behavioral change. So we integrated all of that in this online intervention and uh, we chose a universal audience to start. Uh, we chose, as indicated before, a multiple approach, multiple strategies to change. Not everybody changes according to behavioral, cognitive behavioral techniques. Some people change their emotions before they change their behaviors. So some people change their thoughts before they engage in positive uh, action. So we integrated all of these models in a scenario-based skill building approach. Um, and basically, uh, that was the rationale for creating an online intervention. Uh, as I indicated earlier, all these domains of well-being are highly correlated to one another. So we did a randomized control trial, actually, with 495 UM faculty and staff. Some of you may have participated in the study. 
and we did this about a, a year ago, and we evaluated well-being at three points in time, uh, immediately with randomization after 30 days, and then we did a follow-up after 60 days. And people in the placebo uh, uh, scenario, they were referred to other websites like the CDC and NIH for authoritative websites providing just information. Whereas the people in Fund for Wellness, uh, they experience a lot of games, video games, uh, scenarios, coaching, etc. Uh, so basically, we evaluated uh, well-being, we evaluated actions. Did you change anything? Are you eating better? Are you walking more? Are you sleeping better? So we ask all these questions, and we also evaluated self-efficacy in the domain of well-being, because self-efficacy is predictive of very many good things. Um, so Fun for Wellness really takes you through the bet I can model that Ora explained before. So people learn about setting a goal, creating positive habits, all the different skills that Ora described earlier. And this is just a screenshot. We have a variety of activities to teach you how to set a goal. It has to be specific, measurable, and we teach this through case studies. Uh, we have actual actors, professional actors, we work with the School of Communication, we work with the School of with Computer Science Department, so it was a very interdisciplinary project to put this together, and people can work, set their own goals and keep track of their own goals, and these are some screenshots of the videos dealing with different domains of well-being. So at the top we have a teacher who is slightly overweight, so she struggles with physical issues, and we have Erin over there at the top right hand corner. She has psychological issues. She's a student at a university. And we have scenarios. These are little videos. We have 36 videos about the different struggles people go through. And we created 16 video games. These are two, three minute video games that reinforce the lessons about the bear I can um, methods that Ora described earlier. So the results of the randomized control trial in synthesis are as follows. We, we found the improvement in well-being in the psychological, interpersonal, community, and economic domains. What we did seems to be making a difference in people's well-being, and people also report not just perception improvement, but also actions. They took some action to improve their interpersonal and as well as their physical well-being and very importantly, there was improvement in self-efficacy. Um, so these are the different uh, results that were recently pu published in Prevention Science. We're very pleased with this uh, first uh, paper. Uh, this shows the significant results for 60 days and 30 days improvements. And this paper, uh, this has already been published, actually, in Psychology of Sport and Exercise. So we have improvements with regards to actions. And uh, this paper is dealing with self-efficacy. So what are the summary and limitations of our study? Uh, first of all, Fun for Wellness is efficacious in improving well-being, perceptions, actions, and self-efficacy. So we're pretty happy about that. Uh, there is the potential to reach millions of people, it's low cost, it's accessible 24-7, it's something that you can recommend to your patients, to people you work with, it's free, it's confidential. But the main limitation really is that, as I'm fond of saying, fitness is not enough. You also need fairness in people's lives, because some, peop some of your clients, some of your patients are affected by very negative environmental conditions, they live in toxic environment. So obviously improving their fitness, their physical, psychological fitness is important, but that's not going to change the world. We also need to make some structural changes to the communities where they live. That's a subject for another, for another lecture. Our future directions is that we want to test the existing version with various subpopulations. We want to explore, for example, whether parents who have a child with a disability 
may improve the overall physical, psychological well-being of the family. We want to try this with people perhaps who experience mood disorders, people with obesity, diabetes. So there are many potential applications to customize fun for wellness to subpopulations. And eventually, we want to train group facilitators. So this isn't just an online program. The online program can reinforce a face-to-face -face intervention. So some of, these are some of the things we want to do. So I'm going to continue recording. And we are uh, pretty much coming to the end. Let me just see where we are. OK, so oops. This is a quick review, OK? Pay attention. <laughs> Very quick review. Remember this one? Oh, that was great. Yeah. Okay, so we're almost done. Um, so there we go. Gosh, it takes a while. Hey, that was the end, anyways. So, anyways, thank you very much. And